Receiver 2 is the sequel to Receiver, the game that was apparently made in 7 days for some kind of FPS challenge where you played a nameless, bodiless person stuck in a creepy building complex. Listening to audio tapes, learning about the inner workings of small firearms, and avoiding a mysterious presence known as the Mind Kill. It wasn't really a very good game though, it relied pretty heavily on RNG, and it looked like what happens when you try to play an old game and the textures don't load in properly. Well, now Receiver 2 is out and you're still playing as a nameless, bodiless person stuck in a creepy building complex, and your goal still involves listening to archaic cassette tapes. Doesn't feel like it was developed in 7 days though, in fact it actually now feels like a proper game, mostly anyway. It's part first person shooter, part psychological horror, part social commentary, and also part gun safety. If by the end of your time with this thing you're not constantly putting the safety on all of your weapons, then you've missed out on the entire point of this whole experiment. Like the first game, this thing takes the handling and safety of firearms pretty damn seriously. You'll be learning how to fully load and deload a bunch of weapons, the type of thing that self-confessed internet gun experts who've never even fired a gun in real life latch onto more than a dog with a bone. When everything clicks though, Receiver 2 is a very fun and addictive game, there's no mistake about it, but it's also incredibly confusing, frustrating, and in one very big way it's quite literally one step forward and two steps back. Having said all that though, why can't I stop playing it? Yeah! Visually, I think this looks a whole lot better than the first game. Some of the environments you move through look pretty much photorealistic. The lighting is atmospheric but also functional with the drones and turrets shining out these bright, highly visible blue lights, making it much easier to see the direction they're scanning. It's a shame that there's not all that much variety to any of it, and after playing for a couple of hours, you're gonna start seeing everything that there is to see. But I mean, at least it's an upgrade from the previous game, which looked a lot like a game engine that had problems buffering. The modeling for all of these weapons is really good too, it's highly accurate and detailed. I love the animations for pulling back the slides, spinning around the cylinder in the revolver, and just being able to bugger around with the workings of all of these firearms. It's combined with some really crisp, clear audio as well. The sounds of the guns going off in this game is likely to burst an eardrum, and it definitely adds a sense of rawness to the shooting. I think this game's version of the Desert Eagle might be one of the most visceral I've ever seen in any shooting game. I mean, it's a goddamn hand cannon, and it's pretty much pornography for the ears. Oh, yeah! But great weapon modeling and sound effects can only take you so far, so let's cover a basic playthrough of what you're going to be doing in Receiver 2. Right, so when the game loads, you're going to start off in a random location with a random gun. You'll start with a pistol and a bit of spare ammo, and maybe if you're really lucky, you'll get a flashlight too. The goal is simple, move around and explore the area to find 5 cassette tapes, and then you can move on to the next level of initiation. Tapes often involve some kind of information on the backstory, like talking about all this crap involving the mind kill, most of which are really ambiguous and not all that descriptive. You have realized that something is wrong with the media and the people around you. And some of them even cause the player to commit suicide. This happens, you gotta quickly unload your gun so your character doesn't blow his brains out. Then it might be a tape that's jovially explaining the history of a particular firearm, for instance. This definitely clashes with the atmosphere for the rest of the game, like hearing the narrator talk cheerfully about the history of like Smith and Wesson, like he's reading for an audiobook or something. Before Batman and Robin, the most famous dynamic duo was Smith and Wesson. Please, please don't go in the garage. Smith and Wesson started rechambering their Model 10s for the slightly more powerful 38 Special cartridge. To whoever finds this, uh, just put my body in the trash. The narration is definitely improved from the first game, though, where that guy sounded like he was being forced to read these tapes at gunpoint or something. Do things make more sense? Now, I said before that this feels like a horror game, and once you start getting into it, I think you'll understand why. And that's because of just how fragile you are and the way that the game's able to build such a creepy and unsettling atmosphere. You're not going up against soldiers, monsters, or demons with big old titties, there's none of that kind of stuff. In fact, your only enemies are stationary turrets that slowly scan left or right. Then later on there's turrets on the ceiling and floating drones, all of which can potentially be killed in a single shot if you know where to aim. This ain't no serious Sam guns blazing kind of shooter. I mean, you might have a dozen or so bullets at any one time, but that can disappear real quick. It's all about the accuracy, see? 
Tarts, for instance, again, a scan left and right, shining out a very noticeable blue light that lets you know which direction they're looking. Now, your options are to either shoot the sensor on the front of the turret, you can aim for the ammo pack on the back so they can't even shoot at you, or you can shoot at the battery on the base of the turret, disabling it entirely. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but contending with these things in the darkness and hearing that high-pitched beat when you're detected is the kind of stuff that just clenches the sphincter in a good way. And I said you were fragile, Sunny Jim, and I mean it. Like a snowflake on social media, if you take a single hit in this thing, you're dead. They're not messing around. Since the lighting's been improved a lot from the first game, it's now a lot easier to ascertain the locations of all these enemies. And you can sneak up behind them and hack into them to shut them down without even having to waste one of your precious bullets. It's a shame that literally nothing else has been done to improve how stealth and detection works in this sequel. With the turrets, you've got maybe half a second to get out of the way before they shoot at you, but like the first game, the drones are just going to start chasing after you instantly. Sometimes giving up one room later, sometimes chasing after you across half the goddamn map. Surprise, motherfucker. Reusing that same simple mechanic of it taking a second or so for you to lose their line of sight before they detected you would have just been a godsend. I also said the game feels like gun safety, and the reason for that is because this game approaches weapon handling pretty damn seriously. A big component of the gameplay is always making sure the weapon is in both a working and a safe order. You can interact with every aspect of the gun. You can take the magazine out, load in each bullet individually, pull back the slide and inspect the chamber, turn a weapon safety on or off, or swap between semi or full auto firing mode. It's kind of like the Riley Reed of gun porn. It almost controls like a VR game too, at least it feels that way in the way that the weapon model kind of moves around on the screen. It's also definitely I think a confusing game initially, but that challenge comes from trying to grapple with all of these buttons that you're going to need to learn. I mean let's take the revolver as an example. So to open the cylinder for the revolver, you press E, right? To close the cylinder, you think you press E again? Well, no, for some reason you press R. To empty the bullets from each chamber, you press V, and then to add in new bullets, you press Z. So that's four buttons to simply reload one of the guns, E, R, Z, and B. Now over time, this does become muscle memory, but I feel like the simplest changes here could have made the controls resonate much more with people already into shooting games. So maybe E could be used to open and close the cylinder. Keep V for dropping out all the bullets, but then make R the button for reloading. It's a simple change, but it means now you're only needing to use three buttons instead of four. Plus, they're all buttons you could press using your index finger. Pressing Z, you're likely going to have to use your ring finger, which is just awkward. With guns that use magazines like the Desert Eagle and the Glock, pulling out the magazine is bound to E. So you'd think putting it back in would be R, right? Well, no, putting it back in is Z, because R is then used to pull back the slide and chamber around. Oh yeah, and you don't just press a single button to load bullets into magazines either. You've first got to pull the magazine out, holster the weapon, being careful not to blow your balls off at the same time, then add in each bullet individually. Then you've got to unholster the weapon, load the magazine in, then pull back the slide to chamber around. And then after that, you can finally fire the weapon. I mean, fuck. Holstering's pretty weird too. Now it's bound to tab by default. Tab, like why not H? H, the button that's been used for holstering guns in like 99% of first person shooters. Yeah, and I wasn't kidding about blowing your bollocks off either. You really have to hold down the holster button until the gun is fully put away or pulled out, or else there's a super high chance of a misfire on you shooting yourself. I mean, if guns are this skittish in real life, it's a wonder anyone in America still has working legs. Weapons are prone to jamming and other mechanical issues too, which requires even more fiddling around with all of these controls. Getting an empty cartridge stuck in your ejection port is the last thing you want, believe me. I've had plenty of empty cartridges stuck in my ejection port. It's not pretty. Oh, and how about this one? How do you think you sprint in this game? By holding down shift? No, by default you mash the W key over and over as fast as possible. Luckily though, you can at least change this one in the controls. Thankfully though, Receiver 2, like the first game, does have this very helpful text display which shows you all of the controls at any given time. And believe me when I say you're gonna need this early on, in fact even after playing for like 5 or 6 hours I was still using it. After a while it does become second nature when it becomes etched into your brain, but simple changes to this layout would have made that happen sooner rather than later, in this case 5 or 6 hours into the game. Probably the biggest issue the game has though is its lame D-ranking system and oh boy, do I just fucking hate this. 
Right, so the whole point of each level, like I said, is to find and absorb these cassette tapes, right? Cassette tapes, which may as well be an alien artifact if you're a Zoomer. Anyway, after you've found five of these, you level up to a higher rank and then move on to the next level. Next level in the sense of it just becoming more difficult with new enemy types, more of them and less ammo. I mean, it's still the same looking warehouses and apartment buildings. But the catch is that every time you die, you lose a rank. You then have to go back through that old level all over again. Uh -huh. Now, I think I dislike this for the sole reason that it just feels like it's being thrown in there to pad out the game's length. I mean, really, the game's only got five levels, right? Because once you finish that fifth level, the game ends. So it seems what they've done is make this a much more tedious and drawn out process by punishing you for losing and pushing you back each time. I mean, imagine if you went for your driving test and then you failed at reverse parking, so the instructor makes you go back and sit the theory test again, asking you about general knowledge, stuff you already know the answers to. I mean, that's what it feels like. And I can't imagine it's been put in there for any other reason than just to make the game seem longer than it actually is. Considering really outside of using all the guns, each level is pretty much exactly the same. Randomly generated out of a series of apartment buildings, construction sites, and other generic looking locations. Yeah, the placement of items and enemies is different, but it's just the same half a dozen looking rooms over and over, just in different order. At the very least, this could have been an option for people who want to have a real test. If you want to be that hardcore guy on Steam with the Grim Reaper profile pick and the backband who finished Receiver 2 in a single run, well, then good for you. But a mechanic that just outright punishes you and sets you a step back for dying, it's just not very enjoyable. Especially with the issues with the hit registration and a lack of ammo in some of those last levels. In a game where you die in a single hit and have only ever got a handful of bullets, for a drone to survive multiple hits to its weak spot, well, it's just not cricket. And again, RNG is the silent killer here, that dreaded invisible number cruncher that's like a bully at school deciding whether or not he wants to pick on the nerdy kid that day. Sometimes you'll start off with a good gun like the Desert Eagle or the Glock and a flashlight. Sometimes you'll find heaps of bullets in the levels. Sometimes turrets and drones are put in sensible, easily visible locations. Then sometimes you'll get none of that. You'll wander around aimlessly for 20 minutes. No ammo, no cassette tapes, and so many drones and turrets that you think Skynet has finally started to rise up and take over. This game is so brutal sometimes that if you were lying on the ground dying from thirst, the game wouldn't even piss in your mouth. The only time I ever managed to finally get to the last level was because I found three tapes literally in three rooms right next to each other. And the only time I ever managed to beat this thing, I got really lucky with drone placement, and the game was generous with ammo for the single action army revolver. Yeah, I should mention the last thing you get is a Colt single action army revolver, and boy, does this thing slap. Pretty good. What do you get when you finally finish the whole thing? Well, you get another cassette tape making a meta statement, referencing that you're just playing a video game before an error message, and then the game throws you right back to the first level. I mean, even the first game at least had a bunch of still images. Ultimately, Receiver 2 is still a better game than Receiver 1, and as a masturbatory tool for gun nuts, it's pretty much unmatched. But it is severely handicapped by this stupid D-ranking system. And the whole thing just pisses me off. It pisses me off. Hopefully, if they ever make a Receiver 3, though, all the parts will finally come together. Get it? Parts? Because of all the gun parts and stuff? If nothing else, though, it at least did make me wary of not shooting my dick off with a Desert Eagle, so it's got that going for it. 